Joining us for this week's Your Health segment is Dr. Zainab Maksumi, Assistant Professor of Dermatology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and Dermatologic Surgeon at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, welcome back. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me back. Perfect timing. The summer solstice in two weeks. The sun's at its strongest in this part of the country. And from your perspective, I guess people aren't doing enough about that. That's right. That's right. The time is here. And um, unfortunately, every year we're seeing just an increase and increase in the incidence of both melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer. So, And we want to focus on the melanoma, which is by far the, m the most serious type. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and so, you know, while there are three most common kinds of skin cancer, the, the two most common basal cell and squamous cells certainly account for the overwhelming majority of cases. Um, they're, they're not the most deadly. The most deadly is, is malignant melanoma. And um, the most recent estimates are about 80,000 new cases every year in the U.S., which doesn't sound like a lot, but, but when you look at how many people are dying of that melanoma, it's, it's just unbelievable. I mean, it's about 10,000 people per year. So it, that's almost a 10% case fatality rate. So it's, 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 it's quite deadly. Why would the incidence of that be increasing? I mean, as a, as a civilization, we probably used to be outdoors mm -hmm. more than we are today, and certainly it seems like people are aware you need to wear some sunscreen. Definitely, and the, and the good thing is, is, is I think part of that could be increased detection, and so while we're looking out for it more, maybe, you know, you could be seeing a slight increase because of that. I, I think mostly the true increased incidence we're seeing is because a couple of things. One is genetic mutations that are directly responsible for melanoma. Now we're discovering that some genes are responsible for that. And secondly, melanoma is caused by that brief, brief intermittent ultraviolet exposure. So a quick sunburn you get, you know, in, in six or eight hours, even one sunburn doubles your risk for melanoma. So while overall we're doing better in covering up and trying to stay out of the sun, just that brief, intense sunburn, that's what causes melanoma. And that's what is, is quite difficult to control. So everybody knows about that link, the, the sun causing skin cancer, but the genetic side of it that's new. It is. It is. And, and that's it is the new part. But I but I also think that's the exciting part. That's where, you know, it's it's been quite exciting to, to be a practicing dermatologist while they're discovering all these genetic mutations for melanoma. And one of the most common ones, the, the BRAF gene um, in 2011, Vemurafenib came out, um, was FDA approved for the it's, it's a BRAF inhibitor. And so it's it's you know, we're finding these new genes involved in melanoma, but the exciting part is, is we have targeted medications that can shut off that mutation, that can shut down the melanoma, which are used with surgery to, to really, really have a chance at some of these more advanced cases. Okay, so uh, obviously it's a situation where you want to prevent it. Uh, you also want to catch it early. Yeah. I have a couple of slides off of the uh, cancer website that Great. show some, some different things that can show up on your skin. And according to this website, all five of, of these lesions or bumps are described as moles. Uh, you looked at it and, and we were a little concerned about one of them. <laughs> I was. We looked at this together. And I, I think certainly the top three um, in my mind are are certainly maybe atypical, but they would not warrant, you know, any red flags or alarms in my in my mind. I think the bottom one on the left has a little bit of concern to me. You know, we talk about the A, B, C, D, E of, of melanoma. And so for patients, I try to always counsel them um, to look for A is for asymmetry. So any mole that you can't slice down the middle and have it look the exact same on both sides. Anything, mirror image. Mirror, anything right. that's not a mirror, exactly, not a mirror image is concerning. Anything with a, the B is for border, so any mole with an irregular border, you know. That, that brings us to the next slide, but continue. Yeah, anything with an, so this is, yeah, this hits sort of all the, those points for, for melanoma. This has a very irregular border. You can see it's not nice and even. It's quite scalloped, so it's sort of ballooning out at the border. C is for color, so this has a lot of different colors in it. Benign moles should really have an even, soft, dark, light, whatever brown tinge to it, an even color. This has pinks and light browns and dark browns, even white in the middle, so irregular so, color. Somebody watching, if you've got one of those, you need to do something about it pronto. Yeah. 
at pronto, yeah. double pronto. Yeah, absolutely. If you have, I, I, I mean, I, as you were saying right before we came on, I, I don't know of you know any dermatologist who would just say, you know, oh yeah. no, that looks great. Absolutely. Okay, so you got as far as color. Whoa. And then D is diameter. So any any mole with a diameter greater than about six millimeters. So just for for um, size reference, that's about the size of a pencil eraser. Anything larger than six millimeters um, is a little bit concerning and. E is for evolution, and, and I truly feel like E is, is the most important because that's where patients come in. I mean, I, I tell my patients that you're more likely to find your melanoma than me. If you're gonna get melanoma, you are more likely to find it because you, you know your skin. You know your skin better than I know your skin. So any mole that's evolving, any mole that's changing, you know, you should look at your skin once every two or three months and anything you see changing, growing, that's when you wanna give us a call. Something like that melanoma we saw, how, how fast does something like that grow? Good question. Sometimes on the order of six months, sometimes, you know, a little bit longer. There's a subtype of melanoma called lentigo maligna. They're very slow growing. These types of melanomas typically grow over five, 10 years. But usually, if you're gonna see a change in a mole, it should be within about six to 12 months. Let me remind our viewers, if you have a question about skin cancer or dermatology in general, give us a call. The number's up on the screen. You can also tweet your questions. Our Twitter address is at MPT News. Let me ask you, uh, ask you a difficult question. So we saw those, those five bumps, which uh, according to the website, reputable website, were all normal moles. So there's, there's degrees of levels of concern that a trained doctor would have. Do you go to your general practitioner, your nurse practitioner, your primary care doctor as a starting point with an issue like this? Absolutely, I think that our primary care professionals, our primary care colleagues are truly on the front lines. And I think that they see way more skin than we as the dermatologists and, and, and skin surgeons do. And so I think that that's a fantastic place to start. But if, if, if your level of concern is heightened, I, you know, I, I certainly think it would be reasonable to reach out directly to a dermatologist, especially if you have a risk factor for melanoma. A lot of things put you at height, heightened risk for melanoma. If you have a first degree relative who's had it, if you personally have had it, if you've had blistering sunburns, I mean, those are sort of reasons in and of themselves to, to reach out to your dermatologist directly. Okay, so uh, we were talking before the show, I lifeguarded a million years ago, <laughs> and I don't remember anybody using SPF anything. We had this zinc oxide stuff that right. was mostly to look cool, <laughs> as opposed to the sun protection. Um, but, you know, we got burned all summer long, and uh, you don't want that to happen to your kids these days. Right, no, and it, it's and times have changed. I have a lot of patients who come in for surgery who say that their parents had them out there with baby oil, iodine, and and you know tin foil. But no, times have changed now, and and we know the tin foil, thankfully, is not, it's not all that often. Um, but but now times have changed, and we now know that it's it's the, even one blistering sunburn doubles your risk for melanoma, and and it's really you know, crucial, especially in those early years, to keep your kids out of the sun. And so now we're doing a better job. And, and I'm hopeful that we'll see, you know, remember, it takes about 15, 20 years for a lot of that damage to accumulate. So it will be some time before we start to see that ring true on the back end and we start to see that fall in the incidence. Tell me about the, the surgery that, that you do. It's a very specific thing called Mohs surgery. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I'm a, a um, a Mohs surgeon, M-O-H-S, and that's named after Fred Mohs, who pioneered this technique in the 40s. And really the beauty of what I do as a Mohs surgeon is that I don't just take a best guess where a skin cancer is and, and cross my fingers and say, okay, let's hope we got it. I, I only take what I see with my eyes and then I have a lab down the hall and I, I remove the tissue usually from the patient's face and then I go down the hall, I have a technician who freezes the tissue for me, uh, cuts it, stains it, and I look under the microscope and so I see every single portion of that of that skin, of that epidermis and, and underneath. And so if there are any roots and traces to that skin cancer, I know exactly exactly where they are and so I go back and I take a little bit more and we just keep repeating that process until I come back and I say okay you know we, we got it all and, and then once I do that then I we, we do the reconstruction and we we put everything back together let's uh, grab a phone call Prince George's County this is Susie uh, Susie thank you for calling go ahead hi hi my question 
My question is, I am a, um, a black female, light complexion, and I was diagnosed with a basal lesion on my um, pubic area, and it's been removed, but I'd like to know how did it, how did that happen, and should I be concerned? Um, you you, you don't of, frequent the nudist colony, is what you're saying? No, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Susie, thank you very much for the phone call. We'll get you an answer on the air. Can, can you... Uh, Get one of these without the sun hitting it? Absolutely. Absolutely you can. And it's not just, uh, it's not just ultraviolet radiation causing these, these skin cancers. It's also sometimes with basal cells genetic mutations. There are some genes, in particular the patch gene, that are mutated in basal cell carcinoma. And so it's not necessary. I mean, certainly the overwhelming majority of basal cells are on the head, neck, arms, hands, but absolutely. I would say at least twice a year I do surgery in the genital regions for, for a basal cell. And, and, and the, the darker, um, the darker uh, skin you are, the more heavily pigmented your skin is, the, lo the lower your risk for skin cancer, but it's certainly not zero. So if you have dark skin, um, do you still need to think about sunscreen and exams the same way? Definitely, definitely, and and that goes back to especially if you're predisposed to, to skin cancer. I mean, if you've, as Susie said, you know, she's had one skin cancer, so Susie, you are for the next year to two at increased risk for a second. So if you've had a history of skin cancer, you're at increased risk regardless of your Fitzpatrick skin type, so definitely. Um, Baltimore City, this is Tammy. Uh, Tammy, thanks for the call, go ahead. Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are I you? I'm okay. I have two questions, actually. Sure. Okay. I have down around my ankle area and um, the lower heel of my foot, but not under the foot. There are like skin tags. I would, that's the closest thing I could, analogy I could come up with. And they're all different shapes. And they're, they get very dry. And like, mm -hmm. even if they're like itch, will like pop off or something, but they always come back. And the second part of my question is, also on my lower extremities of my legs, and it's mostly on the outer part of my calves. Now, mind you, I used to swim every day when I was a kid. I was out in the sun. I'm over 50. I was told this could be hormonal. It could be from the sun. It, you know, anything. I have these, um, these little, I don't, for lack of another word, I'll call them lesions, but they're not really, they're spots. Yeah. Tammy, like, hold, let me... Uh, and they're all like oval-type spots, and they're like yeah. a very light tan, and they also get dry. So, like, yeah. when I exfoliate, they'll come off and they'll get dry, but they always come back. Tammy, thank you for calling. We'll get you an answer on the air. A little hard to play skin doctor when you can't see any I of this. I know. It, from what she's Tammy's describing, it sounds actually, Tammy, like both of these spots are what we call seborrheic keratoses, and they're they're very benign is the good news. The bad news is they're they're very annoying and they're equally hard to, to get rid of. Moisturizing is, is a, a, a nice way to kind of keep them from getting dry and itchy. Um, but, you know, the, the, the malignant potential, the chance of these becoming skin cancer is essentially zero. It's more just they're an annoyance and kind of tolerating it. Still might want to have somebody take a look at it. Definitely. Yeah. You know, we were talking before about vitamin D. Yes. So vitamin D is important for a lot of things, bone density. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways we get it is it's made in the skin. Mm -hmm. Sunlight hits the skin and some version of photosynthesis or something, right. you, get, you get vitamin D. <laughs> so if we're all staying indoors, are we all going to be vitamin D deficient? Right. Um, and that is something that's so um, sort of trending, for lack of a better word, right now, because there are so many people walking around who are vitamin D deficient. And now it's, oh, my gosh, have we gone overboard with staying out of the sun? And now we don't have vitamin D. And, and I think the, the consensus amongst, you know, from the American Academy of Dermatology and, you know, from dermatologist is that there that you have plenty of, of sun exposure even just on your hands for five minutes outside for the conversion of you know of vitamin D3 in order to absorb enough and and that's why we have supplements as well and so I recommend all my patients to take a supplement of vitamin D and if it's truly very critically low then your physician can also sort of prescribe a higher dose of vitamin D but it's not 
the, the vitamin D deficiency, it's certainly not a prescription for us to sort of go out free range, carte blanche, go outside and, and get some get some rays in there. All right. So what do you tell somebody who likes to get some rays because they think it makes them the, the old uh, healthy glow? It's really tough. I think that that um, who was it, Coco Chanel or whoever it was that kind of started that bronzed goddess look. I think that we're sort of fighting that, that stigma and trying to, I tell my patients that pale is really cool and it's really in right now. So, you know, spray tans are great. I recommend spray tans to a lot of my patients if they absolutely have to have that, that bronzed look. Um, they, they do the trick. So. And you don't like tanning salons, I'm guessing. Hate them. Let's get Hate another them. phone call here. <laughs> Baltimore City, uh, this is Sally. Uh, Sally, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Uh, yes, this is a public health uh, question. Okay. Um, I noticed something on my back. I went to a senior expo, and um, there was a, 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 a booth there with nurses, and they looked at it and said, get to your uh, a dermatologist. Well, I did, and they took care of it. And it was successful. The question is, where are the um, places that people can go to get a quick diagnosis like this? Because we are not always able to get to our dermatologist that quickly. Great phone call, Th Sally. Thank you very much. Glad you're doing well. Yeah, that's Maybe. that's a good story, Sally. Thanks for calling in with that. And and I think that that is something. Access to care is something that we talk about all the time, and, and we know that it's sometimes hard. You pick up a phone, and there's a six-month wait with a dermatologist. If there's not a free screening near you, um, what, what I would suggest is going through your primary care doctor and making sure you tell them, hey, listen, I have a mole that's really, really concerning. You know, all physicians know the danger of melanoma. They know that, that the, the risk's at stake, and so they would be able to get, to get you in quickly and hopefully make that appropriate referral to a dermatologist. Good place to leave it. Dr. Zainab Maksumi of the University of Maryland, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Do appreciate it. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.